Do you believe in ghosts? When I was seven years old, I inherited a cheap plastic alarm clock from an older sibling. It wasn't digital, it was the little square kind that requires you to set the alarm using a dial on the clock face. After tinkering with it for a while, I set it on my little desk next to my bedroom door, all the way across the room from my bed, and forgot about it. Forgot, that is, until it awoke me with a dull buzz at what must have been three in the morning or so. I was a pretty excitable kid with an interest in ghosts and scary stories. I knew it would be crazy to try myself to walk across my dark room and stop the buzzing. Surely my mother would hear from my parents' room down the hall and come to my rescue. So I pulled my blanket over my head, plugged my ears, and tried to go back to sleep. But there it was, still buzzing, and maybe at this point alerting all the other ghosts and ghouls in the neighborhood as to my whereabouts, so I gathered up my courage and moved my blanket aside. Just then, a figure walked into the dark room, over to the desk, and the alarm stopped ringing. I thought I recognized that white nightgown with flower print. Mom had come to the rescue at last, so I called out to thank her. Mom? The figure turned and seemed to look at me, and then it vanished. I wasn't a terribly superstitious boy, but I also wasn't a hard-boiled skeptic, so in the morning I had to find out what really happened. At breakfast I thanked my mother for turning off the alarm clock during the night. I told her I was sorry that it went off. I didn't really know how to work it. Maybe she could teach me. Her answer wasn't very helpful. She asked, what alarm clock? She had no idea what I was talking about. You're probably saying to yourself, huh, Blair's mom must have been in the fog of sleep or something, forgot that she turned off the alarm. Or maybe you're thinking that the clock had a shutoff mechanism that kicked in after a few minutes, in addition to the little rectangular button protruding from the clock top. You might even tell yourself I made the whole thing up. All I can say is it is a true memory of mine, so think about your impulse to explain it away. Something inside you is working quickly to erase the sense that something like this could really happen. What an interesting reflex. What are we supposed to do with supernatural tales like this? You might be entertained by them, or you might be unsettled. But here's the thing. If a story like this is true, then maybe our fear is justified. Latter-day Saint archives contain all kinds of lore about times when the border between this world and the next becomes thin. Like when a long-lost relative helps a genealogist discover an old family Bible that happens to list the names and baptismal dates of family members stretching back to the 1700s. Or a trio of ancient prophets traveling the world to help pave the way for missionaries or maybe help change a flat tire on a lonely, dusty road. These stories remind us of the connections between this world and the next. But not all of them bring on the warm fuzzies. Some can send a shiver down your spine. Not all spirits, as the stories go, are interested in helping you discover a long-lost relative. Some just want you for your body. To possess it, that is. I'm Blair Hodges, and this is the Maxwell Institute Podcast, Special Edition. In the candlelit world of Joseph Smith, devils and demons prowled the earth. Smith's translation of the Book of Mormon had been available for purchase for less than a month when he legally organized the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith was the 24-year-old founder and prophet of the church, and he quickly learned that there is, indeed, opposition in all things. He found himself in a showdown with the devil. Here's the story as he tells it in the history of the church. During this month of April, I, Joseph Smith, went on a visit to the residence of Mr. Joseph Knight. Mr. Knight and his family were universalists, but were willing to reason with me upon my religious views, and were, as usual, friendly and hospitable. We held several meetings in the neighborhood. Among those who attended our meetings regularly was Newell Knight, son of Joseph Knight. He and I had many serious conversations on the important subject of man's eternal salvation. We were in the habit of praying much at our meetings, and Newell had said that he would try and take up his cross and pray vocally during meeting. But when we again met together, he rather excused himself, and so he would wait until he should get into the woods by himself, and there he would pray. Accordingly, he deferred praying until next morning, 
when he retired into the woods where, according to his own account afterwards, he made several attempts to pray, but could scarcely do so, feeling that he had not done his duty, but that he should have prayed in the presence of others. He began to feel uneasy and continued to feel worse both in mind and body until, upon reaching his own house, his appearance alarmed his wife very much. He requested her to go and bring me to him. I went and found him suffering very much in his mind, and his body being acted upon in a very strange manner, his visage and limbs distorted and twisted in every shape and appearance possible to imagine, and finally he was caught up off the floor of the apartment and tossed about most fearfully. After he had thus suffered for a time, I succeeded in getting hold of him by the hand, when almost immediately he spoke to me, and with very great earnestness requested of me that I should cast the devil out of him, saying that he knew he was in him, and that he also knew that I could cast him out. I replied, If you know that I can, it shall be done. And then, almost unconsciously, I rebuked the devil, and commanded him in the name of Jesus Christ to depart from him, when immediately Newell spoke out and said that he saw the devil leave him and vanish from his sight. The scene was now entirely changed, for as soon as the devil had departed from our friend, his countenance became natural, his distortions of body ceased, and almost immediately the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him, and the visions of eternity were opened to his view. He afterwards related his experience as follows. I now began to feel a most pleasing sensation resting upon me, and immediately the visions of heaven were opened to my view. I felt myself attracted upward, and remained for some time enwrapped in contemplation, insomuch that I knew not what was going on in the room. By and by I felt some weight pressing upon my shoulder and the side of my head, which served to recall me to a sense of my situation, and I found that the Spirit of the Lord had actually caught me up off the floor, and that my shoulder and head were pressing against the beams. All this was witnessed by many to their great astonishment and satisfaction when they saw the devil thus cast out and the power of God and his Holy Spirit thus made manifest. So soon as consciousness returned, his bodily weakness was such that we were obliged to lay him upon his bed and wait upon him for some time. As may be expected, such a scene as this contributed much to make believers of those who witnessed it. And finally, the greater part of them became members of the church. With his feet firmly back on the ground, Newell Knight joined the Mormons officially. But not everyone was impressed with this story. A local newspaper reported satirically on the event. The age of miracles has again arrived, and if the least reliance can be placed upon the assertions daily made by the gold Bible apostles, which is somewhat doubtful, no prophet since the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus has outperformed half so many wonders as have been attributed to that spindle-shanked ignoramus Joe Smith. Joe's greatest, as well as latest, miracle, as narrated by St. Martin, is his casting out of a devil of uncommon size from a miserable man in the neighborhood of the Great Bend of the Susquehanna. The whole family of spirits who are said to have possessed the fair Magdalene were mere children when compared to the imp in question. Such was his malignant disposition that before Joe took him in hand, he had nigh demolished the frail tenement which had for a long time afforded him a comfortable shelter. He said, the flesh was about to cleave from my bones, the muscles, tendons, etc. could no longer perform their different functions. The habitation of Satan was about to be laid open to the light of day when the prophet interfered, went to prayer, and the demoniac had faith. The devil was routed and nature resumed her accustomed order. That sarcastic account from the Palmyra Reflector newspaper appeared in June of 1830. It was printed several years before Joseph Smith's account appeared. It's clear that the reflector didn't take the account seriously, but the Latter-day Saints took it with utmost seriousness. Who are we to believe? Before we try to answer that question, think about our urge to ask it to begin with. Why do we want to know so badly? Stories like this are unsettling. A man possessed by the devil being lifted off the ground, it's understandable why people rush to account for them, fitting them inside our neat boxes of belief. These accounts represent delusions, or perhaps mental illness, or even straight-up fraud. Others believe they provide anecdotal evidence for a real cosmic warfare between good and evil. Of course, most experts agree that you can't scientifically prove stories about demon possession or exorcism. But still, these stories are valuable to consider whether you believe such things are possible or not. Stories about battles with evil from an unseen world can tell us a lot about the hopes and the fears of our own hearts. No historian of Mormonism has spent as much time thinking about Mormon exorcism as Stephen Taysom. 
He's an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion at Cleveland State University. Taysom sees Newell Knight's story as just one more in a long history of demon possession, going back to the time of Jesus. The New Testament contains multiple stories of Jesus and his disciples casting out devils. The New Testament is a collection of stories and letters, but it never lays out a systematized description of spiritual beings like angels and demons. They're just taken for granted, like the weather patterns. And as the rain falls on the just and unjust, Christians shared a lot in common with non-Christians at the time, including their beliefs about demons. They seem to borrow as much from their pagan neighbors as from their ancient Jewish history. Satan has an interesting history for starters. Here's religious studies scholar Stephen C. Taysom. He joined us through Skype to give us background throughout the episode. Well, yeah, so if you look at the Hebrew Bible, uh, you can't find any mention of a character that fills the same role that Satan does in the New Testament. Of course, Satan is just a word in Hebrew, meaning obstacle or adversary, and it's used at various points in the Hebrew Bible. But with the possible exception of the book of Job, you don't have a character that represents and embodies evil. So sometime in the intertestamental period, that idea emerged in Second Temple Judaism, that there was this being that somehow represented evil, is personification of evil. And the only reason we know that is because it shows up in the Gospels that we now know as the New Testament. Now, of course, ancient Israelites believed in evil spirits, and uh, Solomon, you know, was famous uh, as an exorcist. But in terms of Satan himself, that's an idea that, that doesn't emerge uh, until we see Christianity coming out of it. And very early on, possibly because of their interaction with pagans and others, nature, people who worship nature and so on, they developed deep ideas about demonology, the existence of evil spirits. They elaborated on the stuff in, in the Bible, which frankly is pretty sparse. Uh, we, you know, the Bible talks about exorcism, talks about demon possession, but it doesn't really elaborate on what Satan is. Then after the New Testament's put together, Christians imagine Satan in new ways, including what he looks like. When I teach my class on uh, the devil and evil in comparative historical perspective, first day I ask my students to draw a picture of the devil, and they all do it. And they all draw what you would expect, horns and a tail and fuzzy legs. And, and I, we, we discuss how they know that, and none of them know how they know it. So we talk about those ideas. But they come out of Christianity bumping into various what they call pagan religions. And so, you know, goats... You know, he's seen as evil, that becomes part of Satan's, you know, look. And so he develops that way. And as time goes on, more and more things get attributed to him in terms of what it is he wants to do and his general, you know, his evil and nefarious ways. And so a lot of anti-Semitism uh, is linked with devil lore, for example. Uh, and then we get this the same period, we get these stories about people who make deals with the devil and sell their souls. And so th there's a general rise in the importance of this figure in the religion generally that wasn't present uh, necessarily before the 4th or 5th century. As Roman Catholicism developed into the Middle Ages, Christian thought about demons and Satan kept up with the times. Exorcism was a hot topic during the period of the Middle Ages. And it's during that period uh, and the early modern period very early modern period where you see a lot of freelance exorcists going around. Now there was an exorcistic element to the ritual of baptism in uh, Roman Catholicism from a very early date, but going out casting out spirits is something that started happening on a large scale as Catholicism moved through Europe in the Middle Ages. When Protestants began to break away from the Catholic Church, they didn't create new ideas about old scratch from scratch. They brought ideas about evil spirits and possession along with them. Some Catholics would say the evil spirits actually carried the Protestants, of course. So like you'd expect from a Protestant, they didn't just do exactly what the Catholics had been doing. Steve Taysom told me that they called their new dispossession rituals deliverance. The decision for them to move away from exorcism uh, as a ritual really had everything to do with the politics of the Reformation and getting rid of what they saw as ostentatious manifestations of religion, particularly liturgically. So the observance of 
rituals performed by priests was seen as being something that interfered with an individual's relationship with God. And exorcism became part of this, what they called popish behavior. And so they just sort of distanced themselves from it. But the folk beliefs continued uh, around the, the notion of possession and exorcism. The way that they approached dispossession changed, however, from a formal ritual, like you would see in Roman Catholicism, to a process of fasting and prayer uh, over the soul of somebody who was afflicted or obsessed or possessed. Latter-day Saints eventually took a similar posture toward Catholics that Protestants did. LDS Apostle Bruce R. McConkie, for example, mentioned exorcism in his mid-20th century smash hit book, Mormon Doctrine. Um, if you look in McConkie's work, he basically says there's no such thing as an exorcism uh, because that's what Catholics do and it's false. It was in this way especially that Mormons were descendants of the Puritans before them. The Puritans had the same worries about exorcism. They believed deeply in the power of evil spirits, and they saw the Catholic Church as being rife with them, after all. Not only that, but they feared Protestantism was being contaminated by Catholic thinking. The devil isn't going to cast out the devil, so Catholic exorcisms just weren't going to cut it. So, the Puritans used things like fasting and prayer to get the job done, and surely you've heard something about their little witchcraft phase. They rooted out people who'd made pacts with the devil in exchange for evil powers. As Mormonism came on the scene in the 1800s, Taysom says they shared with broader Christianity a belief in spirits and a belief that the boundaries between the human and spirit realm are permeable to these entities and can be penetrated by them. So although they shared a common core of belief, Mormons weren't just carbon copies of Puritans and others who came before them. Yeah, so in the religious world that Joseph Smith occupied and in, in which he was trying to carve out space for himself, uh, you had Roman Catholics who in the American context were actually becoming less and less interested in possession and exorcism. And then you had the evangelicals who, after the First Great Awakening and in the Second Great Awakening, sort of took over uh, dominance in the American religious mainstream. Evangelicals had various uh, kind of a continuum of beliefs about what the devil was, what he could possess, you know, could he possess a body, could he afflict somebody. And primarily what you see in evangelical discourse in the 19th century around Joseph Smith's time is the idea that the devil can afflict someone, hurt them, get in their way, cause problems for their conversion to Christ. For Joseph Smith, he had a slightly more Catholic view of it, that the devil was in fact a being with physical power that could manifest itself not just in terms of distracting you from your thoughts or getting in the way of your conversion experience, but could actually physically assault you, as he reported in his first vision experience. Evil powers made their presence known from the very beginning of Mormonism. Even before the Newell Knight encounter, Joseph Smith himself provides the description. When he was 14, he was visited by God and Jesus Christ. But before they appeared, the powers of darkness attempted to thwart his mission. Joseph's wrestle with the devil isn't hidden away today. It's not completely forgotten in Latter-day Saint thought. But I'm also not sure that I would say it's been heavily emphasized either. Which is funny, because for me as a kid, that was the most interesting part of it. I remember the movie that they used to show. Right. Um, you know, that included that. And there are some versions of the first vision where he actually talks in more detail about hearing footsteps and yeah. standing up and seeing what's there. I remember that film too. It was produced in 1976. And in the film, a narrator quotes Joseph Smith's words from the officially canonized version of the first vision. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. Our Father, which art in heaven, please. I had scarcely done so, when immediately I was seized upon by some power, which entirely overcame me, 
and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. At the very moment I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. A couple decades later, the church produced a new First Vision film, picking out pieces from the various accounts recorded by Joseph Smith and others. In one version of the new film, this evil presence isn't there at all. Maybe it doesn't play as well with today's audiences. That kind of drops out, um, at least as a direct expression of the devil kind of messing with people. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart. saw a pillar of light. Of course, you can try to put Satan in the basement, but it's not always easy to keep him down there. In 2015, the LDS Church not only produced a new film of the First Vision, but they also formatted it for a newly constructed theater in the Church History Museum, where you can be submerged into the story yourself, surrounded by a 240-degree circular screen, and the evil presence is back in surround sound. After I retired into the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go to obtain mercy. It was the first time in my life that I had made the attempt to pray vocally. Oh, God. Immediately, I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so I could not speak. My mind filled with doubts and all manner of inappropriate images. It seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction, but exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me Lord! My mouth was open. Have mercy on me. And my tongue liberated. Forgive me. Joseph? Not only is the evil presence back, but the film includes more details about it from Smith's accounts than any previous LDS film that I've seen to date. After being cast out of an earlier film, the evil presence returns, stronger than ever. Early Mormons didn't talk about exorcism specifically, especially using that term, but they still had ways to deal with the devil and with other evil spirits. What did LDS prophet Joseph Smith think about these supernatural beings? Well, initially he was drawing heavily on Protestant thought, you know, and Christian thought more broadly, which was that the devil exists, he's a personage, he was once in the presence of God, and that he represents evil on the earth. But Joseph Smith's notions about the role of the body in God's plan uh, of salvation, as he called it, changed or elaborated a little bit on received notions about the devil. Uh, so he started to talk about Satan as somebody who's, who was denied a body as punishment and who sought to obtain bodies as part of his warfare on the souls on earth. Mormons are a people who believe in miracles. If I asked you what the first miracle of Mormonism was, what would you say? Joseph Smith's first vision, was that a miracle? Perhaps the translation of the Book of Mormon by the Plowboy Prophet. 
these events preceded the founding of the church itself. So what about once the church was founded? What was the first miracle? An angelic visitation of apostles restoring priesthood keys or visions during the dedication of the Kirtland Temple of angels descending? Joseph Smith himself dated the first miracle much earlier than that. In fact, he dated it just after the church was officially legally established. Remember Newell Knight's possession when he rose off the floor and in the midst of commotion, Joseph Smith cast the devil out? Joseph Smith himself described it like this. He said, it was the first miracle which was done in this church or by any member of it. You see, to Joseph Smith, this power over cosmic enemies marked the beginning of the church's public ministry. And why not? After all, one of the earliest recorded miracles of Jesus's ministry was the exorcism at the synagogue in Capernaum. You've already heard one account of the Newell Knight exorcism. In fact, you've heard two, one from Joseph Smith and one from the Palmyra Reflector. Steve Taysom's description of the event is a little bit less dramatic than both of those. Joseph Smith was friends with the Knight family and had been for a long time. And there's this famous story about how Newell Knight is thrown around the room, physically, bodily thrown around the room by the devil. And Joseph Smith, you know, he's possessed. The devil does this stuff to him. Joseph Smith is called in and commands the, uh, the devil to leave. And in that case, you're getting a kind of hybrid of the Catholic notion that a specific ritual has to be performed to cast them out, you know, and in this case, you know, this, the ritual involves touching, and the Protestant view, which is the invocation of the name of Christ to get rid of this, the spirit. And so in those, and, and, but also the whole Catholic idea and the Protestant folk ideas about the devil at the contortion of the limbs, levitation, um, all those things that made it onto the Catholic diagnostic lists a couple of centuries earlier show up in the night exorcism. Even though the account of Newell Knight's possession is right there in the official history of the church, it's not discussed very often among Mormons today. In fact, I think most of them would be surprised to hear that Joseph Smith said it was the first miracle of the church. Stephen Taysom has compiled a massive archive of Latter-day Saint stories about demon possession, but levitation in particular, like in Newell's case, doesn't make many appearances at all. So what are we supposed to make of a claim like this, that someone could be lifted up off the floor? Well, it, it, I mean, it might seem preposterous, right? The idea that an evil spirit could take over your body or make you do things. I know the magician David Blaine has this levitation trick. You've probably seen footage of the stage production of Peter Pan, too. That's where the children fly through the air. They're on these thin wires. But, but what about real levitation? It reminded me of Carlos Iyer's recent lecture during the Maxwell Institute's Reformation Conference. Carlos is a leading scholar of the Protestant Reformation. And during his presentation, he told the story of how the world became increasingly disenchanted through the Reformation. So if you find yourself doubting the possibility of the devil taking over Newell Knight's body and making him float off the ground, and then the spirit of the Lord doing the same, try to keep in mind you've inherited the skepticism that was born during the Protestant Reformation. You see, that's when natural began in earnest to nudge the supernatural out of the bounds of respectable opinion. But even as many Protestants came to disbelieve in miraculous occurrences, other people, and many Catholics, for example, still experienced the miraculous. For example, there's a 17th century Catholic saint, Joseph of Cupertino. Carlos Iyer related a remarkable story of this saint's levitations. Here's Carlos Iyer telling the tale, and you'll hear our enlightenment-inflected audience here at Brigham Young University laughing along right where you'd expect. St. Joseph of Cupertino, the best known levitator or flyer in Christian history. And in case you're also interested, patron saint of anyone who flies and patron saint of test takers. <laughs> I'm serious, yeah. St. Joseph of Cupertino was a Franciscan who was very simple-minded. As a matter of fact, in his hometown, he was known as Boca Aperta, or open mouth. <laughs> He was so simple-minded that the Franciscans wouldn't take him, but eventually they do. But he would go into ecstasies, being a good Franciscan at just about anything, including natural things. Again, natural, supernatural. One story told about Joseph Cupertino, someone cuts a pomegranate in half and he sees the inside of that wonderful thing and whoop, up he goes into ecstasy, levitates. And he would always make that sound too when levitating or something like that. All you can read is he made a whoop. So I, 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 I guess it sounded like that. Whoop. Yeah. 
Franciscans have to keep moving him to ever more remote locations because he's such a distraction. So they move him to Osimo. He's near the Holy House of Loreto, and he sees the Holy House of Loreto, and that alone makes him levitate. So think again of street magicians who do magic tricks, where they play with angles and shadows to make themselves appear to be floating. In some of the TV specials of David Blaine, it seems he probably even uses wires. And there's that skepticism again. But floating stationary in midair wasn't all that Joseph of Cupertino would do. He also um, flew from one end of the nave to the other in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi, and in doing so, converted a Lutheran prince who said, Ooh, they must be right. <laughs> St. Joseph of Cupertino was a man who hovered in holiness between heaven and earth, perhaps not yet ready for the angelic choirs above, but too good and simple for the corrupted earth at his feet, at least for a time. I talked to Dr. Iyer later that day, and I asked him what he made of such incredible claims. He said, I'm a historian, a scholar. So naturally, I recognize such things seem impossible. Historians like me can't prove something like this happened. But then Dr. Ayer's voice lowered a bit and a little smile spread across his face and he said, but you know, there are an awful lot of accounts of such things in the historical record, an awful lot. I don't know if St. Joseph of Cupertino could float in the air, or if Newell Knight was raised up to the roof against his will. For St. Joseph of Cupertino and his fellow witnesses, it was the work of God. Newell Knight's levitation seemed to be the work of the devil to Joseph Smith. A loss of bodily control, a loss of personal agency, you see, such things would run counter to the theology that Joseph restored, where personal choice and accountability play such a big role. But then the levitation took on a heavenly hue, again hovering in a holy way above the earthly soil, but not so far into the heavens, so as that Newell lost sight of his fellow Latter-day Saints. So who knows how Joseph Smith would have reacted to St. Joseph of Cupertino. The context suggests it's something that he may have been open to, especially in the early years of Mormonism. The context, you see, this is how scholars like Stephen Taysom tend to talk about supernatural stories and experiences. The historical record can't prove that they happened, but the stories themselves tell us a lot about the people who tell them, what they feared, what they hoped, how they viewed the world. Stories like this, scholars like to say, perform work. As Stephen Taysom collected and then studied his impressive library of Mormon exorcism stories, he investigated them on multiple levels. He wanted to know about the practical work they do, the symbolic work they do, and the cultural work they do. You can take any miraculous story and investigate it on these levels, the practical, the symbolic, and the cultural. In Newell Knight's case, the practical work is that Joseph Smith cast the devil out of Newell Knight. That was the basic claim, but it symbolized something even greater. Its symbolic work provided evidence of Joseph Smith's power, his calling from God. The cultural work is just as interesting. The cultural work, that's where the scholars come in, right? That's where our work is at. And we sort of read these performances in their cultural contexts to see if there may be broader issues at play other than simply casting out the devil. That's the practical level. Or fighting between good and evil. The symbolic level. But when Joseph Smith later identified this story as the first miracle after the church's organization, the narrative performed the cultural work of calling attention to the ongoing warfare he expected the saints to encounter, calling their attention also to the power God gave them to overcome the evil one. Scholars can approach any tradition and history looking for this kind of cultural work. There are lots of cases in European history in particular where, where scholars pay a great deal of attention to the kinds of cultural work that's being done. Um, so the case of Nicola Bray, for example, in France uh, is one that deals with you know, the ability of women to have a voice in a male-dominated culture, and they do that through possession. You know, it gives them a chance to be listened to and heard. Uh, in a way that they're not when they're speaking in their own voice. So those are the kinds of things scholars are looking for. And when I talked about the various cases in this uh, article, and I mean, there were hundreds of others I could have used, and the collection was massive that I generated. Uh, I'm trying to find a cultural uh, explanation, some cultural work, but you, it's not exhaustive. Other scholars can look at it and find different things going on. Historians can detect some of the cultural work by paying attention to the way stories sometimes change over time. 
consider another Mormon exorcism story, the Pomfret Branch in New York. You see, Joseph Smith was not the only Mormon exorcist at work in the 1830s. In 1839, the same year that Joseph Smith recorded his exorcism of night for his official history, a newly baptized 16-year-old Latter-day Saint named Lorenzo Brown participated in a very dramatic series of exorcisms. Lorenzo and his family and a handful of other members of the LDS Church were part of a very small and isolated branch in Pomfret, New York, along the shores of Lake Erie. This little branch met at the home of Lorenzo, the home he was growing up in, where they witnessed many gifts of the Spirit together, like miraculous healings and speaking in tongues. By the time they joined the LDS Church, they already had a nice collection of miraculous family lore. Lorenzo once told the story of how his grandfather predicted the day, hour, and minute of his own death. And then there was Lorenzo's father, Benjamin Brown, who one night was drying his clothes by the fireplace when an angel appeared and instructed him not to join any church yet, because the angel said the true church was about to be restored. Benjamin and his family and some close friends joined the Mormons shortly thereafter, forming this little branch. Tongues, prophecies, and angels weren't the only miracles that they witnessed together. Benjamin recorded an affidavit, complete with the signatures of other witnesses to the event, of a startling battle with dark forces. Here's Benjamin's affidavit. On this day passed a marvelous scene before the elders of Israel. We were called to cast out devils which had entered Sister Crosby. After praying and fasting seventeen hours, by the power of the Holy Ghost one was cast out, which was seen and felt, for he attacked all of us, shook me on the side and in the face seized Brother Moore on the arms, which made them sore for some time. The devil was seen in the room, and at length he entered into Brother Melvin with such power that it seemed as he would be pressed to death. He could not speak, but made signs. We laid hands on him, and cast it out in the name of Jesus Christ. When he came out, he came snarling like a dog. We cast out thirty-seven, in a variety of forms and noises, some like dogs, cats, hogs, pigs, and snakes. These were seen and heard by many of the saints. And the room became darkened like a mist, and the smell was like brimstone, but more filthy. It affected our eyes so that we had to wash them. Also, our mouths much affected. Some heard noise like thunder and saw lightning. Some were punched in the face, others in the arms. Others heard him gnash with his teeth. So this was many witnesses, both men and women, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the symbolic and practical work is basically what it always is, which is there's an evil spirit, or in this case, the devil. But it's basically good versus evil, right? The devil is cast out, and they use the priesthood, to which they had been recently ordained, the men in the community had been recently ordained to the priesthood, and they use that to cast out the devil. That affidavit wasn't the only time Benjamin Brown talked about the frightening encounter. In the later telling of it, it's much simplified a lot of the folk elements, for example, the identification of the devil manifesting as certain animals, which is a big part of the first account, are dropped. And it becomes more clearly about maintaining priesthood order. What might explain the differences in these accounts? The first one from 1839 and the other one from 1853. Why did the animals drop away, but the importance of priesthood authority became even more central? Broadly speaking, it's the ongoing confrontation between the LDS Church in Utah and the American government, primarily over the issue of polygamy and sort of secondarily over the issues of the mixture of church and state, uh, too much Mormon power and so forth. And uh, there was this, you know, a heavy emphasis uh, during the those years of the need for Latter-day Saints to kind of respect priesthood authority, maintain order within their own world so that they could successfully challenge the sort of incursions that were happening uh, from both legally, milita even militarily in the late 1850s, from the so-called Gentile world. By the 1850s, Stephen Taysom says, casting out evil spirits had become solidly tied to the Melchizedek priesthood in the LDS Church, but not to any particular office within that priesthood. An elder c could presumably control an evil spirit just as well as the president of the church, as long as they had the requisite preparation and faith. And speaking of elders, Mormon missionaries were far more likely than other church members to report cases of possession and exorcism.
In 1888, a Mormon woman in the Southern States Mission requested a visit from the missionaries. She was possessed by a devil and asked them to help by the laying on of hands. They were happy to comply, and the evil spirit was summarily dismissed. Things were following the typical script, or more accurately, they were helping to write the Mormon script. Variations on a theme. Exorcism, particularly if you look at the European context, the Catholic context, everybody in the performance agrees on what the script is. Okay, so there's a script for how possessed people behave, and there's a script for how the dispossession is going to be carried out. In the Mormon context, particularly in the early years where they're getting converts, the script for how to be possessed isn't fixed. So it shifts all the time. And so she's bringing with her whatever her background was about what being possessed meant. And so she's performing these oracular functions. She claims she could see the future. And she was initially telling them things like, they, you know, if you, if you cross this footbridge, you're going to fall off and hurt yourself. And they didn't, they didn't listen to her. They fell off and, you know, one of them fell off and hurt his leg. Uh, and then she would predict things about, you know, a child would be sick and then get better. And, and so she had this kind of reputation as this oracular kind of priestess. A priestess. In Mormonism, only men have been ordained to the priesthood, but early LDS women were known to speak prophecies and speak in tongues, even bless and heal the sick by the laying on of hands. So even here, she was following what Taysom calls the script. But then she went off script. She told the elders that she was receiving divine revelations in their behalf. But then she starts talking about uh, how one of them is gonna take her as a plural wife. Of course, this was during the period when polygamy was still being practiced, and it wasn't unheard of for missionaries to bring back wives. Their main concern when they heard about this, though, was how to get her back without running afoul of the law, because this was during the period of the raid, where you know polygamists were sort of driven underground, leaders were hiding, and so they wrote a letter, you know, they had the audacity to write a letter to Wilford Woodruff and ask him what they ought to do, and Wilford, you know, how to get her back, because she said one of them was gonna marry her, and so they had to sort of figure out a way to get her back. Uh, they acted like they didn't have much choice. Uh, so Woodruff was not pleased with this. And instead of replying to them, wrote back to the mission president, basically asking him what kind of a circus he was allowing to <laughs> be run down there. Yeah, he said to, quote, give them a severe rebuke. Yeah. So the mission president paid him a visit and, in fact, rebuked them. Uh, and then at that point, is when he's decided, the mission president, that she must have been possessed at some point. He said, well, they exercised her once, but then evil spirits must have come back. And uh, that's what accounted for her supernatural abilities and also for her desire to attach herself to these missionaries. You see, there was one more catch to this story. She was actually married and had three or four children. The mission president, echoing Wilford Woodruff's alarm, diagnosed the possession with that in mind. Family and gender dynamics played a large role. Here's what the mission president reported. The object of this evil spirit was to get these elders to commit adultery with this woman. They had no right to receive revelations through this or any other woman. If the Lord had anything to reveal to them pertaining to their duties, it was their privilege to receive the revelation. The elders are not sent out here to get wives. They are sent to preach the gospel and strictly commanded to let women alone. These elders debase their priesthood in making it subject to the devil through this woman. If the object was to discredit her, why not just accuse the woman of lying? Well, that's harder to do when she's already proven her ability to prophesy so accurately. But perhaps there was something more to it in this story. Historians can only speculate about the cultural work. It's hard to know for sure. Um, but my reading of this is that it's sort of shot through with gender tensions. So the fact that this is a woman who is, you know, claiming revelation very much in the vein that men claimed revelation for plural marriage. Um, you know, this was a common thing going all the way back to Joseph Smith was that, you know, God, they would say, God told me you're to be my wife. And then you know, discussion would ensue there. But here she was claiming this, kind of reversing it. And I think that was one of the main reasons the mission president had a problem with it and that Wilfred Woodruff had a problem with it. Obviously, an adjunct problem to that was the fact that polygamy was becoming more and more problematic and that the missionaries weren't really supposed to be doing that. But I don't think you can discount the fact that we're dealing with a woman's voice here. And if this were a man, I think things would have worked out slightly differently. But it's interesting that in the world's context, 
the vast majority of reported cases of possession are women. Latter-day Saints continued to share stories of possession and exorcism into the 20th century, when they haven't completely dried up in the present. But the archive thins out significantly over time, Stephen Taysom found. The supernatural seems to keep giving way to the natural. The demon-haunted world seems to become less demon-haunted. A sociologist named Michael Cuneo, who specializes on the subject, said that by the 1960s, exorcism was all but dead and forgotten. But like I said earlier, you can put the devil in the basement, but that doesn't mean he'll stay there. Exorcism came back in a big way during the 1970s. If you're listening with children present, now might be a good time to have them go do something else. Listener discretion's advised. Exorcism surged in the popular imagination in the year 1973. What was going on? Here's a little clue. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. The world of darkness. Nobody expected it. Nobody believed it. And nothing could stop it. There are no experts. You probably know as much about possession as most priests. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. I'm telling you that that thing upstairs isn't my daughter. Now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that! The one hope, the only hope, the exorcist. This movie called The Exorcist was a smash hit. It was based on a novel by William Peter Blatty. But the novel was actually based on uh, a real occurrence, a real you know, claimed exorcism that had occurred in the 1940s that Blatty had found out about as a student at Georgetown University. And he researched it and then he novelized it into this, you know, what became this extremely famous film. Now, a little bit of background. Before this, Roman Catholics had in the American context, done everything they could to uh, distance themselves from exorcism. Uh, you know, it was it, it had been part of anti-Catholic lore deep in American history uh, that Catholics were superstitious, that they engaged in all these strange rituals. You know, basically, they weren't Protestant enough, uh, obviously. And so, as they became more and more kind of mainstream Americans, they dropped away from this. There weren't very many exorcists working in America at the time this film came out. When the film came out, it revolutionized everything. All of a sudden, everybody wanted in on the exorcism business. And this is where we see the birth of these deliverance ministries. So Protestant churches, you know, sort of st storefront churches whose purpose is only to deliver people from evil spirits. Uh, Roman Catholics get more interested in uh, exorcism again. They start up a training center for exorcists at the Vatican. Now, the reason that it happens in the 70s Cuneo speculates that it's this period of real unrest in the United States. The sexual revolution is happening. The Vietnam War is winding down. You have this revolution in mores. And so the book focuses on this young pre-adolescent girl who sort of becomes obscene. And there's sort of some symbolism there. You know, And the idea that Cuneo draws out is that Americans were trying to deal with youth culture and all of these sort of attendant transitions. And the exorcist film resonated with Americans because of those themes. Catholics and Protestants weren't the only ones with stories to tell in the wake of the exorcist film. In fact, one of the most interesting stories in Stephen Taysom's archive of Mormon exorcisms happened in 1977, and it features current Latter-day Saint apostle M. Russell Ballard. 
Taysom tells the tale. Well, so this story uh, I found, it's the only one in the collection that isn't a strictly a first person narrative. This one is from the Journal of Leonard Arrington, who was uh, at the time serving as church historian. And he was invited to uh, someone's home in Salt Lake City and there was a gathering there and Elder Ballard was there. Uh, at the time, he had just finished serving as a mission president in Eastern Canada. And he was very soon to be called, or, or had already been called, I can't remember, to the first quorum of 70. So he tells the story of a woman who was possessed in the mission field, and the missionaries try and cast out the evil spirit, or, and they don't know if it's the devil or not, they just think it's an evil spirit. They try to cast it out, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. She goes on a temple trip, and they report that when she's in the temple, everything is fine. But when she, as soon as she gets out of the temple, she starts to manifest this again. And the sources, uh, Arrington's journal is not clear about what Ballard said her symptoms were at the time in the earliest phase of the possession. They just say they, they couldn't get rid of it. And so uh, Elder Ballard hears about this and travels to where the woman is. And as soon as he gets there, according to the account, the woman starts to react violently. And Ballard, for some reason, instructs the stake president, who was also there, to lay his hands on the woman and cast the devil out. And Ballard diagnoses her as being possessed by the devil himself during this process. So the stake president does it and it works, but only for a minute. So the missionaries did it, it didn't work at all. The stake president does it, the devil leaves the woman for a moment and then supposedly comes back in. And then Elder Ballard says, well, I guess I'll have to take over. And so he takes over and lays his hands on her and this takes about 30 minutes of him. I think he says he's having a discourse with Satan, um, obviously through the woman's voice, until finally he casts, succeeds in casting the devil out. And then he interprets this story for his audience by saying that clearly the reason that he was able to do it was the devil had to respond to the highest church authority in the region. Now, there's nothing in the earlier history of exorcism in the church to indicate that the position of authority somebody held had any bearing at all on the ability to cast out evil spirits. The Melchizedek priesthood was the primary vehicle for that. And anyone who held the Melchizedek priesthood was seen as being more or less equal in their ability to pronounce a healing blessing or cast out an evil spirit. But here you've got, in his account, a sensitivity apparently on the devil's part, to hierarchy, and that he was apparently sensitive to the highest church authority that could conveniently present himself. Um, because obviously, if we follow this logic through, the devil would only be would only leave people if the president of the church cast them out. So here, in the way that Ballard is imagining the devil, and the way that more, you know he's changing the Mormon imagination, the devil is responding to this increased bureaucracy by respecting it, essentially, um, which really reflects the expansion of the Mormon hierarchy during the 1970s, uh, the advent of the first quorum of 70, and the kind of increasing standardization that put priesthood office and you know the keys of authority somewhat in competition with the priesthood itself as a power. The Exorcist film and the Correlation Movement? Could that really explain Elder Ballard's experience? Could it explain it away? Stephen Taysom says it really isn't that simple. Any kind of cultural influence question is really difficult, unless someone says, you know, I read this and then I started to behave in this way, uh, which people tend not to say. <laughs> right. and, and ideas get transmitted through culture uh, in a wide variety of ways. No, I don't imagine Elder Ballard sitting around, you know, up nights reading The Exorcist or, you know, going to see it uh, while he was a mission president or whatever. I'm sure that didn't happen. Um, but those ideas get out into the culture and the expectation of what any uh, of what the devil is going to do, those are all influenced by by culture. The devil himself even perhaps influenced by culture. Elder Ballard may have emphasized the church's hierarchy in his encounter with an evil spirit in 1977, but the experience itself seems to have slipped through the correlation cracks. 
The church's official handbook of instructions contains detailed descriptions of LDS ordinances and rituals, like baptism, priesthood ordination, and blessing the sick. Casting out evil spirits, however, has no official ritual standing within Mormonism. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, Mormon leaders spoke openly about possession and exorcism, but there's no prescribed exorcism ritual. There's no official way to diagnose a demoniac. In a religion that's become as highly centralized and allows as little room for ritual innovation as Mormonism does, Stephen Taysom says it's unusual to find something like this that's both practiced and not officially prescribed. Despite official silence on the subject, Mormons have a long and continuing history of battling and casting out evil spirits. The stories that we've talked about today of Mormon exorcism are all included in an article Stephen Taysom published in the journal Religion and American Culture. His archive of stories was far too large to cover in one article or in one podcast episode, though, and most stories were left on the cutting room floor. There was one that I wish that I could have included uh, from the early 20th century um, that occurred in southern Idaho uh, in uh, near Pocatello. And this was a, a case where a woman had joined the church, but she had ties to, you know, she's from the south, and she had ties to kind of charismatic tongue-speaking uh, denominations in her background. And she became uh, possessed, and the, her possession uh, was interesting because the state president was having her go to doctors. He wasn't sure if this was medical or if it was spiritual, what to do about it. And so they had multiple exorcisms performed on her over a lengthy period of time. And the conversations that the spirits would have, because it was the, the devil was there, but also other spirits. And the more she learned about Mormonism, the more the spirits seemed to learn about Mormonism. And so she learned about work for the dead and she learned about, you know, the degrees of glory. And so the spirits were talking about how they had witnessed uh, others of their kind. So here she was talking to people who had lived and had died and were in what Mormons call spirit prison. And she talks about seeing them, or the spirits inside of her were talking about how they had seen their friends disappear, ascend into uh, a paradise. Uh, and so she has these conversations, you know, in the voice of the spirits with the people who are sort of sent to watch over her and make sure she doesn't hurt herself. And that case goes on for a very long time, and it's you know, it has so many uh, nuances to it that I just couldn't include it. But it was the most important one that didn't make it into the into the article. In my own experience as a Latter Day Saint, I've only rarely heard possession and exorcism stories. Occasionally here or there, I can't really remember exactly where. I just think that I have. To be honest, it's never played a large part in my own life of faith. Stephen Taysom traced mentions of the devil in LDS General Conference sessions. Talk of demons fades away over time, but the devil's still around, although LDS leaders tend not to dwell on him very much. When James E. Faust was an apostle in 1987, he delivered perhaps the last extended conference talk that was solely about the devil. Faust seemed a bit wary about such public discussion, though. He starts things off with a joke before issuing a warning and then a justification for talking about the devil at such length. You may have heard the story, and it is a story of the disruptive, noisy boys in the Sunday school class who were asked by their exasperated teacher why they bothered to attend Sunday school. One of the more impudent boys replied, We came to see you perform a miracle. The teacher walked slowly over to the boy and menacingly responded, We don't perform miracles here, but we do cast out devils. <laughs> For some reason, I feel impressed to speak today against the devil and his angels, the source and mainspring of all evil. I do so prayerfully because Satan is not an enlightening subject. It is not good practice to become intrigued by Satan and his mysteries. No good can come from getting too close to evil. Like playing with fire, it is too easy to get burned. The knowledge of sin tempteth to its commission. 
The only safe course is to keep well distance from him and any of his wicked activities or nefarious practices. However, Brigham Young said it is important to study evil and its consequences. James E. Faust was never one to leave things on a sad note. His conference address included admonitions that Mormons today are still familiar with, even if they don't recall exactly where they heard them. Admonitions intended to give us a leg up on the adversary. However, we need not become paralyzed with fear of Satan's power. He can have no power over us unless we permit it. He is really a coward, and if we stand firm, he will retreat. The Apostle James counseled, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He cannot know our thoughts unless we speak them. And Nephi states, He hath no power over the hearts of people who are righteous. Before we go, there's something that you're still probably wondering about. I hinted at it a little earlier when I asked Carlos Iyer what he thought about the accounts of levitating St. Joseph. What are we supposed to do with these stories? Are they real? And how would historians even assess that question? I couldn't complete an interview with Stephen Taysom without asking for his take on that. Historian Brian Levick points out that demon possession is a methodological landmine for historians. Did you hit any of those as you were going along? Well, no, because he hit them first, and uh, I was able to <laughs> clear the field. able to avoid them. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean it's it's one of those things where you have to be. Uh, the, the landmines he's talking about are really can you separate uh, an account from your analysis of the account. And if you can master that, you can say, okay, this is what they say happened. Now let's apply several different modes of reading this event or the account of the event. Then you're able to avoid the landmines getting tra trapped into, you know, did this happen, for example, or you know, debating whether or not the devil is real or what can the devil do? Those are all questions that insiders uh, are asking as insiders. As a scholar of religion, I'm acting as an outsider, trying to read these events for, you know, whatever kind of broader cultural information I can glean from them. And that's the kind of landmine he was talking about, I think. So I didn't trip on them, although I did run into a lot of people who wanted to know, uh, you know, if I could do an exorcism. That's cool. Can you? I've never tried it. Uh, I suppose it's the first time for everything. I've never seen a possessed person <laughs> okay. uh, that I know of. So no, it's not a practical uh, article. It's not a, it's not a yes. how-to. Of course, Professor Taysom's students aren't always comfortable with the way that he brackets the question about whether evil spirits really exist or really possess people's bodies. They're not comfortable, either because they think he should openly declare that it's all real, or because they're scared that he might verify its reality. I had a woman uh, in one one class get quite angry with me because I was talking about these cases, uh, you know, as I was talking about the development of the idea of the devil and as it gets elaborated over time throughout the uh, intertestamental period in the New Testament. And she said, well, you're acting like the devil doesn't exist. And I said, well, I'm not concerned with that question right now. You know, that's not, we don't have any you know, scholarly evidence one way or the other for that. We're not talking about it. And she said, well, we do have scholarly evidence because Jesus said it was true. Um, I get that kind of reaction, uh, which sort of stops the class. And I have to kind of revamp it a little bit and get them back on track. And occasionally some of the films I show frighten people. I'm surprised at how, given the fact that young people uh, of college age today seem to be inured to almost anything because they've been exposed to so much uh they are still very easily frightened uh, by discussions <laughs> of the devil uh and so in the era of trigger warnings and so on i do have to warn them uh, at the beginning of the class that we we're going to talk about some scary things in here because that's the point of the class to talk about how people have imagined evil so that they could kind of fight it uh in a symbolic fashion and once they understand that that's what we're doing, they calm down. 
And isn't that sort of how it works? Once we understand something, we can work to take control of the situation ourselves. But it's when things feel out of control. That's what can be frustrating, or it can even scare the devil out of us. Figuratively speaking, of course. This special Halloween episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast was written and produced by me, Blair Hodges. As I researched the subject matter to prepare for this episode, you might say something possessed me to try something a little bit different this time. For those of you who didn't already recognize it, the style and format of this episode is a tribute to Aaron Menke's popular award-winning podcast, Lore. If you haven't heard of Lore, I recommend checking it out. That's L-O-R-E, Lore. Aaron Menke draws on non-fictional accounts, folklore, to give you a scare and make you think. Lore was recently turned into an original series on Amazon Prime as well. Music for this episode was provided by Bruno Sanfilippo, Kai Engel, Sten Erland, and Chad Lawson. And my thanks also to Steve Taysom, whose research was obviously indispensable to this episode. Taysom is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion at Cleveland State University. He's the author of the book Shakers, Mormons, and Religious Worlds. His article on Mormonism and exorcism was recently published in the journal Religion and American Culture. The article is called Satan Mourns Naked Upon the Earth, Locating Mormon Possession and Exorcism Rituals in the American Religious Landscape, 1830 to 1977. Christopher Blythe's research on exorcism and Mormonism also provided some useful background. Artist Partial did some investigating for me down at the Church History Museum, tracking down the devil in her spare time. The voice of Joseph Smith was provided by Jeremy King. Morgan Davis provided the voiceover of Newell Knight. Morgan was an appropriate enough choice. He's a direct descendant of Newell Knight. Carl Griffin provided the voice of Benjamin Brown. And Brian Hoglid provided the voice of the mission president. The sarcastic editor of the Palmyra Reflector was none other than Philip Barlow. You can watch Carlos Iyer's Reformation Conference presentation on the Maxwell Institute's YouTube channel. It includes some fascinating portraits of St. Joseph of Cupertino, levitating through the air. We'll be back next time with another regular episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. If you'll excuse me, I think I hear an alarm clock buzzing in the next room.